everybody. Welcome to Plugged Into History, Middleton Place Foundation's digital history portal. Um, today is Let's Talk Tuesday. And this week we are doing some interpreter spotlights. And first up today is Jamal Hall, the resident blacksmith here at Middleton Place. And of course, Jeff Neal is here, our director of interpretation Hi. and preservation. And Jeff is going to be our interviewer today. So thank you all so much for watching. We're going to learn about Jamal today as uh, an interpreter and as a blacksmith and, and how he got into it. So we're going to get the superhero origin story this morning. Um, and then we'll still continue to talk with Jamal tomorrow. So thanks for being here, everybody. We appreciate you. Thanks for um, engaging with Middleton Place digitally and from afar. And I'm going to let these guys take it away. So good morning, Jamal. Good morning, Jeff. Hey, good morning. Welcome. Oh, it's almost like you practiced that. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> you know, when I, when I took over my current position, um, Jamal was actually, you were actually the first person I hired out here. Mm -hmm. And that was, what, 2015? Yeah, that yeah. was about five years ago. What, um, well, how did you get into the field of public history? Let's do the big question first. Okay, so I was a history student at Temple University, and in my sophomore year I did an internship in Delaware State Parks. I worked at Fort Delaware State Park, it's a Civil War site in the Delaware River. Um, I started doing historical interpretation there, and I met a blacksmith there. He taught me how to do it, and from there I just kept doing it. You know, they invited me back the next summer, and I would keep coming back. Yeah. Was your goal there, I mean, you were looking there, I guess, first and foremost as an interpreter, and you kind of fell into the blacksmithing? Uh, yeah, I just kind of fell into the blacksmithing. I, I never imagined or planned, if you had asked me 10 years ago where I saw myself in 10 years, I never would have said blacksmith <laughs> on a plantation in Charleston, you know. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, in interpretation, I had never really saw myself as a historical interpreter. That, that really wasn't, like, when I applied for the job, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> like, honestly, I saw a historical interpreter, I saw the word historical, and I said, oh, okay, it must have something to do with me. So, I, yeah, I applied. I get there, I, I did the interview with my, um, my old boss, um, Laura. Laura, she's watching this. Um, she was, um, <laughs> she um, asked me, okay, um, first question was, um, okay, um, are you okay with wearing wool clothing in the middle of the summer? Um, some days it can get up to like 110 with the humidity and everything. I'm like, what is this job? <laughs> okay, Jamal, do you know what the historical interpreter is? And I said, well, not really. Do you know the guys at Williamsburg that wear the funny outfits and everything? I said, yeah, that's, that's historical interpretation. And I'm like, oh, and that's what we're doing here at Fort Delaware. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So, you know, I tried it out. I didn't mean didn't, didn't turn me. I tried it out. You know, they gave me an outfit kind of similar to this, and um, yeah, they encouraged. We were doing what was called um, first first person interpretation, so we were constantly in character. Um, we had journals from the uh, the soldiers in the um, fort, and they were specifically from around the time of 1863, 1864. So. We focus, most of our records were around the year 1864, so we focused on that year. And it was really cool because we would refer to specific days in the journals. Um, like, for example, there'd be one that would say, um, oh, they're having um, meat in the galley today, you know. So we would walk around and be like, hey, there's going to be meat in the galley today, you know, May 23rd, 1864. And then there'd be a journal entry that says, you know, um, Oh boy, there, uh, there's gonna be somebody. Somebody fought. One of the soldiers um, started fighting. You know, there was an escape attempt or something. And we would just go around and mention these things. And I thought it was just the coolest way to teach history. I thought it was maybe one of the best ways to teach history. Uh, cool. So you you were looking at this really from a teaching point of view. Were, were, were you in college? I mean, were you in education? I take it. No. Or just just history. Just, just history. Cool. Yeah. What, um, as far as at Fort Delaware, and you kind of hit it, so you we were mostly Civil War mm -hmm. interpretation. Yes. Okay. So you were doing that there, and you were using primary sources, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. But did, did you have any, like, I, I, for lack of a better word, characters that you did? Yeah. Personal? Could you share any of those? Yeah. By yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Um, in fact, I can remember back that month. Like, um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, there was a, okay. 
Fort Delaware, there was, um, well, besides the soldiers, of course, they employed many um, freed and runaway um, or enslaved people. And they had them doing just jobs around the fort. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I portrayed one of the, um, well, we, we kind of made a composite character of a runaway slave from Virginia that we know was in the fort. We don't know if it was a blacksmith, but we know that you know there were blacksmiths. Mm -hmm. So um, we kind of made that composite character. His name was Abraham, and that was my character. You know, I walked around. I was Abraham, <laughs> and I did. I had a special program that I used to do every day at like one thirty in the afternoon for um, whoever would show up. You know, sometimes we'd have school groups. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of times we would have. Um, you know, the public would come through and they would sit down and I would do my talk and tell them how I escaped from Virginia, um, ended up in Delaware City, ended up at the fort, and, you know, now I'm learning how to read and I'm learning how to blacksmith and here I am. And, yeah, it was it was really great, you know, I enjoyed that. What kind of reaction did you get from people? You know, I got, I got varied reactions, you know, most of the reactions were positive, you know. People were saying that, oh, these are the types of stories that need to be told, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would have, um, one, one really struck me. I remember there was a school group. I had, uh, it was a group of, like, second graders. And, like, little eight -year -old, this little eight-year-old girl stands up, and she raises her hand. And I said, um, you know, yes. And I'm in character. So she asked me, why did the brown people have to be slaves? And I... So I had to think how in how to in character to answer this. Like I, I wanted to break character and, and answer it. I, I couldn't. So um, from my character's perspective, I just went off the assumption that he wouldn't really know why he was enslaved or why he was treated the way he was or why things were the way they were. Um, so I gave her that answer, but I, I I wish I could have said more. So that's the drawback in doing first person because you know you're limited to what your character knows. Yeah. And you can't really give that, you know, modern day um, perspective. That's, you know, that's really interesting because that, I think that is a, sometimes that, that is a problem sometimes doing the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very much so. Now, so you came from Fort Delaware. Yes. Okay, you're mostly doing Civil War era, yeah. shall we say. And you come to Middleton Place mm -hmm. with this broad range from really, we'll say the mid-1700s all the way up to about the mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. Did you have to change anything how you approach things, or? Yeah, that was that was um, interesting because you know the fort. It was pretty much it was it was a set thing. We were in the year eighteen sixty four. Right. There's nothing you know like I mean we talked. There was plenty of history before that, obviously, but we we focused on that specific year. So that's that's what it was. Um, now here it was like you know we're not we're not in character all the time. Mm -hmm. You know we're just. We are ourselves, we're speaking from the point that it is now 2020, mm -hmm. and, but, you know, we're in the clothing, we're doing the work, we're, you know, explaining to people what this is, um, and we're just, you know, going through a broad range of history, so that's, that's something I had to adjust to, also I had to adjust to, um, we, we focus more on 18th century history, or, you know, when I first got here, we were, you know, doing more 17, and we're still doing more 1700s, yeah. so that was... I had to read more on that because I didn't. I didn't know anything like really. Like I knew things, but I didn't know like much. So yeah, I had to look. I had, I had to learn more. I had to read more. Did you find any like, shall we say, surprises? I mean, you're you're coming from in Fort Delaware. You're yeah. coming from a different time frame, a different place, mm -hmm. and then you're coming down here to the Low Country. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as let's say the interpretation of slavery, just for yes. an example. How did you have to make those adjustments and change? Boy, it was, it, it's, mm, man. Okay, so it was, it was a, not necessarily that we didn't focus on slavery at the fort, um, but it was a little different because my character was a runaway. So mm -hmm. he had already been freed at that point. Right. You know, so, you know, I was explaining to people that I wasn't a slave, that I had escaped from slavery. So slavery did come up, you know, but here it's, you know, this, this is, we're, we're in slavery. Right. You know, we're talking about that time and it's not ended. Here we are. 
So, you know, we're discussing all the dimensions of it and really getting into it. And that's, yeah, that's, that's what I had to really delve into more mm -hmm. of. And with South Carolina, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know much about South Carolina before I came. Why would I? I'm from Delaware. You know, so, you know, I get here, like, I remember I, I'd taken African-American history courses in college, and we had touched on Charleston. You know, we talked about it, but, you know, I never thought much of it. I never right, looked yeah. into it. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a question. Well, we don't. I just wanted to encourage questions. So we have a lot of people have joined us since we started. So I just wanted to reiterate that we are uh, speaking with Jamal Hall here, blacksmith at Middleton Place, and Jeff Neal, our Director of Interpretation and Preservation. And Jeff is asking Jamal questions, but don't forget if you all have questions, that's what this live broadcast is for. Make sure you put them in the comments section for Jamal. He'll be happy to answer them. Um, we are exploring Jamal's journey into historical interpretation so um anyway continue you don't know how the interpretation you know you had to adjust mm -hmm. okay did you have to adjust to your audience i mean did people come in with different preconceived notions or now that you're doing different are there different questions that you incurred up in up in fort delaware That's or? funny you know i was just talking to my co-workers at, at the fort about this actually you know and at the fort fort delaware was such a preparation for this job mm -hmm. Because, you know, what I find is that the people, the questions that I'm getting here are a lot of the same questions I was getting back really? in Fort Delaware. So there really isn't much difference. I think the big difference is that the site is bigger. Yeah. You know, Fort Delaware was, it's, it's a small, it's a, it's, a, it's a fort, it's on a very small island in the middle of the Delaware River. You have to take a boat to get there, mm -hmm. you know. So we have maybe a few hundred people a day that show up. Shout out to Creepy Fort Delaware on Pea Patch Island. I love it. Oh, <laughs> it I love it. It's it's <laughs> creepy in all the best ways. We do have some questions, gents. Yeah. Um, so one that I think maybe if you could answer just really quickly because we're going to get more into this uh, tomorrow. Okay. Um, would blacksmiths mostly make functional things or things for beauty like jewelry? It would be more functional. You know, the plantation was all about function, all about, you know, work and labor. So they needed tools. They needed things to get the jobs done on the plantation. So, um, yeah, jewelry. Not to say that the blacksmiths weren't, you know, expressing themselves artistically. We do know that there's, there's evidence on different plantations of blacksmiths actually making art. And, yeah, expressing themselves. You know? So it wasn't just that they were making tools, but I'd say the tools would be the bigger part of what they're working on. You know, kind of tied in with that, with guests, do you ever find that, do guests come in and it's not so much about the invitation, interpretation, they're like, no, yeah, make something, Yes, I want to see you make it, yes. you know. all the time, all the time, you know, people on, there's, there's people, yeah, you know, like we talk about, you know, people come here with different agendas and different ideas, you know, not everyone wants to hear about the history of slavery, so people want to just come in and watch me. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, you have to... Do you ever find that a hinder or a frustrating at times or... Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's, I don't know, it's sad, you know, we, we've done all this research, we've found all these different things, the foundation has done amazing work with uncovering all of these different truths and resources, you know, and people visit here and all they want to see is just, you know, a couple sparks and maybe yeah. some flowers in the gardens and, you know, but it, you can't force it on people, you know. Yeah. Speaking of that, since we're, we're, we're really kind of hit more of your craft tomorrow as far as blacksmithing, we've been very blessed to be able to um, have you actually portray some characters out here. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I think one of the first ones that, that we developed out here was actually Charles Middleton mm -hmm. um, that we used for our Christmas celebration, mm -hmm. and he's actually a runaway from here in 1778, whatever the date is. How did you approach doing Charles Middleton? Oh boy. I you know, and, and by the way, he's, he's the, the, just to set it for people who are not familiar with it, the guests are actually encountering you while you're running away, or you're actually coming back to say goodbye to your parents before you run away. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that character when you look at? What is your kind of your mindset, or, or what what do you want them to draw from this? You know, five minutes that are with you in this presentation. I just want the biggest thing for Charles Middleton specifically is just that sense of just fear. 
You know, his whole world is just up. He, he doesn't really know what he's getting into. Anything can happen at any moment, you know. So he was trying, like, at that point, at that moment when they encounter him in the gardens, it's just this thing of just, he's trying not to be seen. He's trying to get in and out as quick as possible and just trying not to be, not to have his circumstances change because he's on his way to freedom at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, or he thinks he's on his way to freedom. He hopes he's on his way to freedom, and he doesn't want to mess that up. So, you know, encountering all these people is kind of a shock for him. So he has to try to smooth this over and hopefully make sure that they don't tell the Middletons that he's running around, or, you know, anyone related to the Middletons that he's running around in the garden. So it's just, that would be the main takeaway, just this sense of fear. And the way I approached it is, um... The way I approach any of these characters, you have to come at it with a sense of empathy. You know, um, for me, my own personal belief is that one of the best lessons we get from history is empathy and being able to put yourself in the person's shoes as best you can. You know, obviously I can't fill his shoes, but you know, I can get some idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good so question. We've got them stacking up, but this is a, a great question. Um, you do give Beyond the Field stories. Right. Every now yeah. and then, when the volunteers don't. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you can, Gailey, you can come here and, and potentially catch a bee on the fields with Jamal. Um, so, our <laughs> our friend Brett wants to know, what, uh, if you can recall one, what's your favorite interaction with a guest where you really connected and there was one of those awesome light bulb moments? I was talking with this, uh, there's this one lady, it's, it's, like, it's like maybe a year ago or something. And we were talking, like we had gotten into the conversation of genealogy because I had been, you know, kind of an amateur genealogist on um, Ancestry.com for now about five, six years. I've traced my family back to South Carolina and it's been really exciting. So I was talking about, um, you know, the parts of my family. I had found that they were enslaved in the state. And... Like, I, I, I forget what I said. I said um, that my family was, I said my family was owned by another family. And this lady, she had to take a minute. She was, she's like, wait a minute. Your family was owned by someone else. And she, she, she said it just like that. And she had to pause for a minute. She's like, she, she, hadn't really, like, I, I saw the wheels turning in her head, like, she hadn't really fathomed that before, like, she, like, it, it broken something for her, and, you know, it, in that moment, she, she started to tear up a little bit, she's like, she they owned your family, I can't, what? Like, she couldn't believe it, and so, um, yeah, I, I kind of explained it in more detail, and you know, she just, yeah, that, that was, that was one of the better moments I think I had in terms of connecting with someone. Do you, you feel like sometimes people bring some preconceived notions yeah. with them? Um, yeah. and, and, may, and maybe not always the right preconceived notion, shall we say. I have gotten uh, several people over the years that have, you know, said, well, you know, the slaves were clothed and fed, so, you know, it must not have been that bad, right? We hear um, that all the time, you right? Know, that's must not have been that bad. That's a classic one. Another one. Uh, clothed and fed one. Um, there was. Th this isn't. This is. I've only had one person say this, but this. 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 This is a funny one. Okay. So this lady came in like last year, and she looked at me, and she said, "Well, I can't help but notice there are all these train tracks around Charleston." So. Um, what were the cars like on the Underground Railroad? <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I wanted to laugh, I did, but the lady, the lady, just completely serious, you know, and I was, okay, ma'am, the Underground Railroad is not an actual train. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's, you know, there were, there were conductors, yes, and, you know, people that helped to lead the slaves from point to point to point until they would reach the north, and, hopefully get out, you know, but there was an actual physical train leaving from, you know, and I, I was, I had to 
take a moment because I again I couldn't believe I was explaining this to someone, but yeah, there it was, you know. Um, I had a lady. Oh boy, I had a lady the other the other year who um, had went into Eliza's house. She mm -hmm. looked at that list of people, and she had looked at the list and she thought that all of those numbers in there were ages. Oh my goodness! Yeah, really. She didn't think they were. You know, some, she thought uh, people were four hundred years old. Uh, you know, she. I don't. I think she. Or you know, she was looking at some of the lists and she thought that they were ages. You know, wow. like, and she said, "Well, you know, some of them were living to be 80, 90 years old. So you know, it must. You know, they must have been treated well here." And I'm like, "Ma'am, that's not what that is." You know, and we, she got upset as I explained to her that, you know, because she went into the clothed and fed thing, and mm -hmm. I had to explain to her that. It's not. How, yeah, how do you so, approach it? Because that's probably one of the big things. Just is, really quick, though, can we explain for the people watching at home who may never have been here what list you're talking about in Eliza's house? Yeah, so if you go into Eliza's house, there is a great big list of all the enslaved people that I think that we're aware of um, from the different, from the various Middleton plantations. Mm -hmm. And on those lists, we have, you know, the prices that they were valued at. We have, um, we have lists from Civil War era, from when they were getting, you know, clothes and pants. Um, there are, it's, it's mostly lists of prices and things. So, so the numbers are the monetary value of individuals. You're, you're looking at, Sorry. you're looking at about 2,800 names on that list. Yes. Uh, also, the listing not only with that, it includes family members. Where you can you can see groupings, mm -hmm. mothers and fathers and children, occupation. Mm -hmm. um, there is that monetary value. In some cases, there are some ages as well. Mm -hmm. But I would say the monetary value is probably the one thing that's consistent almost on every list that we have. Mm -hmm. It's there. Getting back to that, um, I think it's interesting you bring up because I do think that's one of the one of the problems is everyone looks at the treatment. Mm -hmm. That almost kind of. Do you ever feel that people try to use that to almost justify the institution, or they try to justify the people owning people? Uh, all right. Sorry. So because my mic was giving static, everybody, I unplugged it, which means you are hearing through the microphone built in to my phone. So I'm sorry. I'm trying to give you a good picture, but also give you good sound. So um, I'll ask these guys to project over PD and his family. <laughs> what we're talking about is a lot of people try to use this treatment. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a justification. Yeah. You know, if they're treated well, then it's, it's okay. It's such a How do you, I mean, to me, that one, just personally, that's mind boggling that yeah. people kind of think of. How do you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, when that comes out. First of all, I have to acknowledge the strangeness of it. We're in 2020 now, and people are trying to justify slavery. Yeah. You know, that's that's number one. Secondly, um, the way I try to justify it is that, first I explain that this is an entirely, it, it's mainly an economic institution. Mm -hmm. The whole point of slavery is for the owner to generate wealth off of these people. So the goal of the for the owner, the overseer, is to keep these enslaved people as alive as long as possible. As long as possible. So, you know, they need clothing, they need food, you know, maybe not the best, maybe not, you know, whatever, but you know just enough to keep them going. Basically. Just enough to keep them alive and working. And so with that, it's whatever treatment, whatever good treatment that they received was not necessarily out of, you know, because it's a, out of benevolence. It's, it's yeah. more of because this is a business. Yeah. I think you, you hit it well with that lady. It's the property. Yeah. That whole thing about being on. You know, that, that leads me to something else. Another character you've done for us, actually down at the Edmondson Austin House, which is a historic house in downtown Charleston, the foundation of we started a new Christmas program mm -hmm. this, this, this past December. And one of the characters um, that you were doing actually was a kind of addressing some of the gifts that were given at Christmas, but your character looked at it in a totally different way. Yeah. And there's this whole act of benevolence, or shall we say. Could you elaborate any on that and how you approach that? Boy, let me come back to that. That was such an interesting thing. Because I, I, if I remember correctly, um, that character, he was, like, on, on the one hand, 
talking about what it was like to be a servant in that house and at the same like just talking about He was talking about his experiences being a servant in the house and you know what it was like and then at the same time he was grateful for his life and for um well god you know christianity um these different things that kind of keep him going because he knows that once this is all over it, he's going to have his ultimate um salvation in heaven and that is that's 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 the thing that keeps him going. That's the thing that motivates him through whatever trouble, through whatever adversity he's going through as a servant in the house. And that man, that 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 was that was that was a great that was just a great character. I tell you, that was probably for the event this year. That was probably the one. I would say the one character or the one scene that actually I think gripped more people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the part where you would, at one point you had talked about someone had mentioned that you know we're we're getting clothes for Christmas and we're getting shoes in this, and your character basically says, "Oh, clothes and shoes." Well, aren't we getting this anyway? We're getting that anyway. We're yeah. getting the thing. Yeah. So how can this be a, an act of benevolence or you know? Anything like that on behalf of the owner. And then I love how he, um, there was, there was a part where he, um, basically just decries, like, all of this, um, decadence. You know, he's walking through the house, you know, and all these fancy candles, these, um, you know, all this wonderful food, you know, all this is nice and everything, but is this really the meaning of Christmas? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. when you get, when you get right down to it. And, yeah. I want to ask you a personal question. Okay. Okay. As an African American, mm -hmm. what does it mean for you to be an interpretate on a plantation, on a former plantation? Well, it means a lot of things. Yeah. Um, for, first of all, it's you know not even that I'm just the African and you know an African American, but you know I'm I'm the only one here, <laughs> you know that's doing this specific line of work. So um, I I do get looked at a little differently from you know the other interpreters that are here. Um, I do feel that there's a little bit of a little more pressure on my shoulders, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I, I try my best to um, have answers for everyone's questions because people are oddly looking to me for more answers. Um, you know, I've had people I've had people come to me directly, you know, with questions about you know my white counterparts. You know, they've asked me, well, why are they here? You know, like you're the only one who really should be here. And I felt I had to defend them. I said, you know, these, you know, although they may not look the part, you know, they are really just as qualified and just as, you know, able to answer any of your questions as I am. You know, it's not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily a thing of, no one's better than anyone out here because of race, essentially. You know, we can't, you know, Middleton Place, we can't discriminate on who we hire because of race, you know. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we've moved past that time. So, um... So you, you feel this pressure also from guests as well sometimes. Yeah, you know, the guests will come through and they'll just specifically ask me questions. I know I get questions that, you know, my other coworkers don't get because they'll ask, they'll ask me about genealogy. You know, they'll ask me about my family history. Yeah. You know, I've had people ask me, like, um, oh, are you from South Carolina? Were your ancestors here in South Carolina? Were you, are you from this plantation? And, you know, I'm not from this. I, I, as far as I'm aware, I'm not, you know. <laughs> Research not, ongoing. Yeah, ongoing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I do, have, I do have a third great uncle with the name Middleton in his name. So, you mm. know, maybe. No. But, uh, yeah, no, um, I haven't. No, no. I want you to finish your thought, but I just want you to know we have some more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I'm, I'm not from this. I don't, I don't believe I have any ancestry from this plantation, but in South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia, yeah, those four states. That's that's where we hail from. So make that time table. Definitely the area. Definitely would the be, area. Would definitely be fair to say. You know, oh, yeah. I got yeah. ancestors in Colleton yeah. County. I got ancestors in York County. Um, I got ancestors out in Beaufort. Yeah, and th that's what I've found so far. So maybe on one of the other Middleton plantations, but no. how do, how does that affect your interpretation? 
I mean, do you feel, is there a, a greater connection? Or do you put pressure on yourself? Like, okay, I really got to you know, do this right, or yeah. however you want to Yeah, it, you both know. of those things, you yeah. know, it adds an extra dimension to it, mm -hmm. because you know, when I'm interpreting, when I'm talking about, when you're talking about slaves or enslaved people, um, it, it's not just like a subject for me, it's not just something that we're like, you, you're reading a book and you see this thing and it's like, oh, okay, you know, when we're talking about slaves, we're talking about, like, that's, some of those people were my ancestors. That's my family, you know, that's my great-great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandmother, you know, that, that's, those are people that were related to me that were in this institution. I can point to them. Mm -hmm. And so that just adds another dimension to it because I can, I talk, I talk about them, you know, as if they are people. Mm -hmm. every, every, each and every one of them has a story and, you know, I can say that because, yeah. They're, they're my family. Do you have any tips for, and this is just quick because I think that this is a longer conversation. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for people tracing their own genealogy? Someone asked a bit ago um, about where, where you've been looking to trace your genealogy and then if you have any tri tips for others. Well, I don't know if there's like a you know, 30 second answer to that question. But. <laughs> yeah, let me try. Um, okay, really quick. Um, I started off on Ancestry.com because I thought that was like the best way to do it. I was, it was like 2012 when I started. I was, uh, God, I was like 18, 19 years old when I started doing it. You know, the best way to start with genealogy, you want to talk to the oldest people in your family. You know, your grandfather, your grandmother, your great aunts, whoever's around. And just ask them what they remember. Ask them about their parents, their grandparents, where they're from, you know, whatever details you can gather. Gather as much details as you can and then get on Ancestry, you know. Uh, if you don't want to pay for Ancestry, there's also FamilySearch.org. That's a free version of Ancestry. It doesn't have as many records as Ancestry, but, you know, it's, it's a good starting point. Um, another thing to note, Ancestry doesn't have everything on there. So there might be records specifically to, you know, specific to your family that may not be available. So you might have to go specifically to those towns or, you know, those states where your family was from and go to the libraries or go to the genealogy societies in those towns or um, they typically have an archives or a record somewhere. You go to those places and, you know, you just have to you do it the old fashioned way. Look, look by hand. Church. Churches too. Churches, um, yeah. Really, I, I gotta, yeah. yeah that, I gotta go up to a church up in York. Actually, yeah. that reminds me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> get, get into that personal side. There was another character you did out here. I think it was for our first Juneteenth celebration mm -hmm. last year. Where, and I can't remember the name of the character. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but anyway, it, it, again, it was kind of a composite mm -hmm. of several people. But we talk about um, your presentation was basically when they found out that they are free. Mm -hmm. And here on, on at Middleton Place, and his reaction to all that. And I remember watching you, and I'll be honest, you went way off script. Matter of fact, you went way off script because it became very personal for you, and you actually you actually broke down. Mm -hmm. What was that? I mean, was that something you were expecting, or I mean, what was that moment for you? Because I mean, that that definitely was a moment. You you hit something. What was that like for you? Well, you know, the reason I kind of went off script there was because I wanted to make it seem realistic. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that was one thing. Um, I didn't mean to go that far off. You know, like if I did, you know, like it was... Oh, like, it incredible impact. But, I mean, you know, like that, that. that, to me, that felt like the most realistic reaction. You know, or at least one realistic reaction. You know, imagine you've been enslaved all your life. You can just try try to imagine that you know you've been on this plantation for all your life, or you've been sold off from another plantation and brought here. You know you don't know where your family is, and all of a sudden somebody breaks the news to you that you are free. And you can do, you can seek other options. You can go to another state. You can I don't know, do do what you want. You, you're an American, and what? You know that's that's incredible, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what really got me. In the weeks before I did that presentation, I went to Georgia, 
you know, I was doing I was doing some research on my great grandmother's side of the family, and she was from a town called Washington, Georgia, out in Wilkes County. Shout out, uh, Wilkes County, from around Washington. Um, I went there to Washington, and there was this big Victorian house out there, and I it was it's now a museum. In the Washington History Museum, it's a very small museum, but they have incredible things in there. Mm -hmm. You know, just stuff going back to you know the 1700s from the area. And yeah, the woman told me that on those steps from that house, the uh, Union soldiers, you know, gathered up all all the, all the former slaves, all all the slaves, all the Negroes, brought them to that yard and announced to them that they were free. And I stood in that spot, you know, and I just looked at that house for a minute and I was like, crap. It, it put me there for a minute. And I tried, I don't know, I tried for a minute to imagine, like, you know, an ancestor standing there, hearing this news, and what now? What next? You know, so that's that's what that's what brought me there. That, that's a powerful thing, because I, I think... Sometimes we look at it too generic. Yeah. Oh, you're free. Okay, that's it. Yeah, right. What exactly does that mean? Yeah. And how did, I mean, yeah. And you, and you did a brilliant, I thought a brilliant job of trying to convey that. I think we have another question. We do, we have lots. So if I could just interject here, everybody who's been asking about how Jamal learned how to be a blacksmith, um, please go back and watch the beginning of this broadcast where he tells us a little bit about his time at Fort Delaware. Um, and he talks about training with the blacksmith at Fort Delaware. Joe, thank you very much for your question. The next family joint reunion will be next year in 2020 in the fall. Um, and then um, Jamal is wonderful sharing personal stories and being vulnerable on Facebook. Shelby, thank you for saying that. Is there somewhere I can donate? To Middleton or to a charity of his choosing. So I wanted to put that out there to you, Jamal. I can certainly give them the donate um, website for here, um, but I wanted to let you speak on that. Yeah, I can use 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> What's your Venmo? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah, I'll, I'll see my Venmo at the bottom. No, um, oh boy, yeah, yeah, please donate to the Middleton Foundation. You know, we, you know, they've been doing, fan, we've been. All of us collectively have been doing fantastic work over the years with interpreting slavery. This is a very difficult subject to interpret, to you know, stand before people day in, day out, and you know, talk to people. And of course, the, um, with the coronavirus going on right now, you know, we've been hit pretty hard, just like everybody else. So, you know, if you would like to donate, please donate to the foundation. Um, That's MiddletonPlace.org/donate. There you go. <laughs> what What is the hardest part about? Hardest part of interpreting slavery, or, or the most challenging, or you know, well, for you. I would say the most difficult part is you're never going to know everything. Yeah, you know, I that's just one thing. You're never going to have all the answers, and there, you know, you get people that come in and they have amazing questions, and you want to be able to answer all of them, but you, sometimes you just I don't know. You know, we we don't know everything, and you know, even now, historians other than us, you know, we're still uncovering new pieces of information mm -hmm. from this institution, and it's. I think that's what people need to realize is that it's. We don't know everything. <laughs> we're we're doing everything we can. We we know as much as we know, but um, we'll never know everything. And I'd say that's probably the diff most difficult part. And you know, of course. Um, I would say another difficult aspect of it is depending who I'm talking to. You know, again, with those preconceived notions. Yeah. Because I get some people that are really stuck in a mindset mm -hmm. and they're unwilling mm -hmm. to listen, you know, to what we've uncovered factually. You know, written, not, it, it's not even just something written in a book, it's written by the Middletons themselves. You know, so I'm, I'm trying to pull from resources that we have here. Um, to make these points and to make these claims and things, but um, you know, some people are just you know unwilling, or you know, they have one way about yeah. it, and you yeah. know, that that could be another aspect of it. Yeah. You know, I want to get to. I know we're going to kind of do blacksmithing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to show your trade, but I thought we would show. This is kind of one of the, the things that you're making. Yeah. Right? And by the way, um, I know a lot of times what we tell people is the artisans here they don't necessarily demonstrate. 
You work. Yeah. You're making stuff out here yeah. that we use all the time. And, and could you just talk about, I know this is one of your latest projects that you're doing. So right now I'm working on a length of chain here. Um, I just decided to make this chain for the doorways here because... Uh, well, show you what we got going on here right now. <laughs> so yeah, rope. The official social distancing rope <laughs> from the Middleton Blacksmith Shop. And, um, yeah, I thought that a chain would look a little bit better for a blacksmith shop and, you know, it might keep some more people at bay. So, <laughs> well chosen, well so, chosen. So, um, yeah, the doorway is about 39 inches wide and right now I got about, uh, well, including this section that I made yesterday, I'm going to link that together with that right there. Um, that's going to be, that's 32 inches of chain, so if I make another section like this, I like to make it in sections, um, I'll have 39 inches. And these are your, these are what you're making the links out and of. This right? is what I start off with. This is uh, mild steel. It's 1080. It's low carbon. It's very easy to work with. So the way I do it, it's not really made in a mold. What you do is you take it, you hit it around the horn of the anvil while it's hot, and then you take the ends and then you heat it to the point where it's melting. You hit it with the hammer and it joins and becomes one piece. And that's what's called forge welding. Forge and that creates a welding. Now. I, I'm going to ask another personal question. Sure. All right. And, and feel free if you want to answer anything. Does it mean anything for you personally? All right. Being a historical interpreter, mm -hmm. being an African American on a place of bondage, and you're making a change. Yeah. I thought about that. You yeah. know, like, I, I thought about that imagery. And I don't, generally, I, you know, I've, I've had visitors, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know what they're thinking, but, you know, generally people are seeing this like, wow, that's a nice chain, you know, they don't really look at it like, you know, this is an African American in 2020 sitting on a plantation making a chain, and, you know, there's, you gotta wonder, you know, what, what else were blacksmiths making at that time, you know, what would chains be used for, you know, um, aside from, you know, what I'm doing with it, you know, possibly restraining someone, possibly. Uh, possibly, um, it, it, you know, who made shackles? Right. right. The blacksmiths. Right. You know, blacksmiths made everything made out of metal. So, you know, I don't know if specifically the blacksmiths here were making shackles, but, you know, blacksmiths somewhere were making shackles. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, to be making something as symbolic as this, you know, on a plantation, you know, just, again, that adds to the dimensions of it, you know, it's... It, you know, I'm 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 in a I'm in a certain place when I come here. You know, I'm I'm in a certain mindset when I come. Don't get me wrong, I have fun here. Like I enjoy talking to people. This is a great job and everything. But I never forget what a place this is. You know, what the meaning of this place is. You know, it's. I don't, I don't know if that answered your question. No, no. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, you, you brought out a very important part of not forgetting what this place was yeah. for, for many people. It, it, like you said earlier, it does vary from people, but let's not forget what this place was, which was a site of bondage. Yeah. There's, there's no, no in, if or doubts about it. Yeah. We know that. I just, I find that interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else that, you know, you can think of that you'd like to share with us, or you know, in what you do, and uh, what what are your hopes for the future, or I don't know, what you do in the future, future or anything? Uh, well, um, I hope to make more programs. You know, like I enjoy you know portraying different enslaved people out here. Um, you know, like I got I got ideas. You know, I will you know just not even just me, but I would love to see like programs of overseer or like Arthur Milton. I wouldn't like, you know, like we've seen, we're seeing it from an African American perspective, but you know, I would like to see it also told from a white perspective as well. Yeah. You know, um, their side of it. You know, what does an overseer sound like talking about slavery? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what does Arthur Middleton think of slavery? You know, like we know what he thinks of the Declaration of Independence, but you know, what does he think of, you know, his, yeah. plant, his plantations and his, his operation? Yeah. You know, you know? Like, so, like, I would love to see things like that, you know, so those, those are just ideas I got floating around. So, so those donations that you're talking about, bring them in, <laughs> and we'll... Yeah, those will help. Yeah. These clothes at Walmart, man, like, right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah.
Um, I did have one question for you, Jamal, as as yourself, Jamal, the man, less about Jamal, the um, interpreted individual. Um, we had lots of questions about the instruments that you play oh. as an accomplished musician, Jamal, the modern man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so outside of here, I play the saxophone. Um, I've been playing the saxophone since high school. It's, you know, I love music. I've always loved music. I, I started... Um, I started playing the clarinet when I was 10, and then I picked up the saxophone when I was about 16 in high school, and I played in a marching band, concert band, <laughs> jazz band, you know, I did all the bands, and, you know, I got to Temple University, I met a bunch of great saxophone players, you know, they were all music majors, they taught me a bunch of stuff, and, you know, I used to, yeah, back in college, you know, College kids, you know, didn't have a whole lot of money, right? So, you know, what I would do is, to pay for some of my books, I would sit out on some of the corners out there and I'd play. And you can make a good amount of money on, there. <laughs> on a good day, you know. Like, I was coming away with hundreds of dollars some days. So, you know, it was easy to get one textbook out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, exactly. So if y'all can't catch Jamal here at Middleton Place for whatever reason, um, if you're local, you may see him playing gigs around town because yeah, uh, he has some you're out in Spartanburg events. on Friday, I'll be playing up at the freight yard from like 6.30 to, yeah, 6.30 to 9.30, I think I'm out there. Right on. So, yeah, Spartanburg. Yeah, Spartanburg. Oh, wow. Right yeah. on. Yeah, we, we got that lined up before are you, think. are you starting to get more gigs? They're starting to come back, come back. Yeah, yeah, you know, but it's a little weird because, um, you know, we're doing the social distancing thing. Not everyone can kind of, we can't, people can't react the way that we, did, yeah. you know, did because, um, like, I just played one last Friday um, downtown at a dispensary, uh, a bar down on King Street, and, you know, it was the limit to how many people could be in the bar. Um, we couldn't, they, they were very specific about people sitting down, they mm -hmm. couldn't stand up or walk around or a mm -hmm. whole lot, you know, unless it was to go to the bathroom. So, you know, we're playing this music and the people are in there, you know, they're, they're having a good time, you know, so they're like, they're, they're trying to get up and dance and everything. But we had to keep telling them, you gotta sit down, you gotta sit down. Sit no, down. man. And they were, you know, it was funny for a minute because they were, they were like, you know, they're, chair they're, dancing. They're, they're chair dancing, you know. You know, well, it, it got a little rowdy. Some people tried to get up, and they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a strange thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ho hopefully, we'll get back to the normal soon. Yeah. That's hope. Yeah, here's hoping. Here's hoping. Well, let me just say to the folks whose questions I didn't ask, it's because they were more about Jamal's interpretation. Um, they are definitely historical questions about Middleton Place. We will make sure to answer them in the comments. But I'd really like to encourage you to come back tomorrow because those are the kinds of questions, things like, how big was the plantation? Where was the blacksmith shop originally? These things that we'll talk about tomorrow. So please, please, if you are able to join us tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., right here again in the blacksmith shop with Jamal and Jeff. Um, so please come back. But um, if I didn't get to your question, it's not because I didn't see it. I promise um, we want to have some content for tomorrow, too. <laughs> so, all right. So make sure if you have any further questions for Jamal about his career as a historian, um, and an interpreter um, about his genealogy work or really anything at all, do put them in the comments. We'll be happy to forward those to Jamal. He'll answer them and then we will put them right under your comment. We'll reply right there. Um, thank you to Shelby and to Brett for your donations already. Holy cow. Nice thank cool. you so much. We so appreciate that. All right, we did it. Um, yeah, woo. Um, so, all right. Uh, did y'all have uh, anything further that you wanted to share today? Or uh, uh, encourage people to come back tomorrow? I think tune in tomorrow for part two, should we say? Yeah. yeah. Stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> this, has, this has been Superhero Jamal Hall's origin story. All right. <laughs> well, thank you all so, so much for joining us today. Really, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for asking. Thank you for engaging with Middleton Place when we uh, can't be together digitally. Um, or rather, when we can't be together in person, at least we can be together digitally. And every time you support uh, Plugged Into History programming like this, 
you are making such a major contribution to Middleton Place and, and even more so when you make a financial contribution. So thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you. We can't wait to see you tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. We will be back for On the Farm Wednesday with Jamal talking more about his interpretation. So thanks so much, gentlemen. We appreciate you being here and being on camera. Thanks for the great interview. We'll see everybody tomorrow.